Dr. Shewitt, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. We are happy to have you. So uh, welcome to the podcast. We're looking forward to this episode. Awesome. Thanks a lot for having me, gentlemen. Yeah. And uh, I know we're talking a little bit before um, before we got on air, but generally like to kind of just start off with some questions, getting to know you um, a little bit better. And um, so, you know, maybe two, three questions. And this first question um, that I have for you is, if you could give yourself any piece of advice um, that for when you start off residency, what would you tell yourself? If you go back and look at your younger self and say, this is the key piece of advice, what would you say? That's a phenomenal question. I think the uh, <clears throat> best piece of advice I could give my younger self is don't get frustrated. It's a long ride. And even if you feel like you're going to, you want to quit multiple times along the way, don't. Everybody has that feeling. Just keep going through it. And it definitely gets better the farther along you get, especially afterwards. That's what I remind myself about every day. No, just kidding. It's like, <laughs> I like you say, I think you have to enjoy the ride. It's, it's uh, everything. Uh, most, most things you work hard for, they end up being worth it at the end of it. So it makes uh, you appreciate it later. Yeah, I don't know anybody that could honestly say they didn't think about quitting at some point in time during almost any residency. So it's just you get through it and it always gets better. Yeah, I don't think it's supposed to be the most loveliest thing in the world. But yeah, it makes you like you say, it makes you better. Now, my, my next question, I'm being selfish here. I, I like to to take advantage of when we have, you know, experts in the field, especially those who work with uh, residents and things like that. Uh, and with you being a uh, adult reconstru reconstruction trained orthopedic surgeon, and you also, you know, you have residents there at your institution and things like that. What are, you know, some of the things you look for, or you would, you would tell someone who's interested in going into uh, uh, adult reconstructions as far as fellowship, what, what are some of the things you would tell him that he uh, should have to, to look forward to or what would make him a better fellow at that point? Sure. I think as far as like stuff they should be doing to get ready for it, um, get as many, obviously, reconstruction cases in a good variety as you can in residency. Um, ideally, get some research. And then as far as like what to look for in a fellowship program, you want a program that's going to get you a good amount of numbers. Uh, my fellowship, I did fellowship at uh, New England Baptist Hospital up in Boston. Uh, I finished the year with 719 joint replacements for the year and about, I think, 11 to 12 percent of that was revisions. Um, so you wow. want a good amount of numbers, make sure you get a good experience of what you want to get, a uh, good variety of approaches. I think I was two-thirds posterior, a third anterior, and then a smattering of uh, anterior lateral and superior approaches. Um, and then you want a place that has good revision volume. So you get good at revisions. You don't need necessarily a massive number of revisions, but a good percentage of it if it's a, a bigger volume place. Awesome. I like that. Yeah. I, that's what I was always thinking. Like, you probably want to get, get through a lot of cases so you can get as much experience as you can throughout that year. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Like arthroplasty is a lot of uh, adjusting stuff and kind of figuring stuff out on the fly. So the more times you go through stuff, the more likely you are to see all the different uh, you know, permutations and changes and issues along the way. Excellent. Excellent. And um, the last question uh, that we have here for you is what hobbies do you have outside of medicine, if you have any? Uh, hobby, I mean, I live out in San Diego, so it's always kind of beautiful year round. So I like going to the beach and stuff like that with my family and then doing some running and trails and stuff like that. And I spend enough time at the hospital inside and clinic inside. So I like to get outside whenever I can. So that's mostly the outdoor stuff. Yeah, I just uh, I just actually just came from California today, and man, it's beautiful over there. I'm, I'm jealous of you guys living the California life. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. Oh yeah, have you ever been uh, surfing, Doctor Shewitt? I, I taught Cody how to surf a couple years ago. <laughs> oh, good. Glad somebody did. Um, yeah, I've been <laughs> surfing a fair amount of time, like not a ton. Um, I haven't gone in probably a month or two. Um, but yeah, I, I go often enough to to be at that point where you think man i could get really good at this if i tried but then every time you go back you get humble a little bit so. yeah the waves they are yeah. they're unforgiving yes that is so true so true all right so we're, we're going to hop into the case uh and, and really this is just more for educational purposes more than anything i think today's talk is going to be uh somewhat general but it, it's good to just kind of have a patient in mind so we're going to do it anyway uh let's say we have a six to eight year old male who's you've been following up in your clinic for some time he's been dealing with some right hip pain for the last two years uh that's it's worse when he's uh walking uh it's kind of he describes the pain as an aching pain that's kind of in his hip kind of radiating into his groin a little bit 
Uh, he's on X-ray. He has advanced uh, degenerative arthritis at the at the at the hip joint. Uh, he's had he's went through physical therapy. He's had uh, steroids, and he's continued to have issues. And he's coming to you now to see what else could he do to help his his symptoms. Kind of you know. And I'm trying to paint the picture of someone who you know they coming in with pretty bad arthritis of their hip. Kind of what is the the history and physical that you're you're, you're doing to work these patients up? So, I, you know, it sounds like he's had a pretty good workup already to at least a certain degree with the uh, non opera stuff. Um, big picture, I'm asking him, you know, any history of trauma to the hip, any history of prior surgeries, whether it's hip scope or something else like that, or if he had any surgeries as a kid. Uh, obviously, you can see sequelae of that on x-rays a lot of the time. Uh, his level of activity, uh, walking tolerance, if his type of person that, you know, used to run three miles a day and now he can barely walk around the block due to his pain. Um, other stuff as far as uh, pain is any pain going up or down the leg, anything that could be indicative of any type of spine pathology. Um, my residents get really sick of it, I think, but uh, I drill into them that, you know, hip and spine have a ton of over overlay uh, as far as symptoms. Um, so just watching out for, you know, making sure you don't do a hip replacement on somebody whose pain is really coming from radiculopathy. Um, and then also get a good past medical history. If they have history of diabetes, uh, if, how well controlled it is, if they have obesity, any type of renal failure. Um, and then in, you know, in neuromuscular disorders are kind of a big topic as far as worrying about uh, stability, also any spine pathology. Um, and then just doing a, you know, very good overall past medical, past surgical, cover everything else. And, you know, I think you mentioned a, a, a huge point there um, when, when you mentioned hip pathology along with spine. Um, cause like you say, it is easily can be overlooked. And like you say, you could be doing the wrong surgery on somebody or doing a surgery that they might not need. Um, and same thing, I think you can, you can see this as well. If you're doing someone who coming in with neck pain or what you think might be cervical, uh, cervical spine pain. And you also have to look at their shoulders, you know, all that stuff is connected and they're so close together. Sometimes those, those nerves, you know, they can kind of fool you just because how interconnected they are. So it's good to keep that in mind. Um, and I'm glad you even mentioned about like the neuromuscular disorders and uh, at, at my institutions and probably most inst institutions in the country, we have a lot of patients who come in who might, may have uh, psychiatric disorders and um, you know, may have substance abuse and things like that. Um, and that's, you know, that's actually something that we can talk about. What do, do you have anything that you, you tell your patients because this is most times a elective surgery. Is there anything that you tell them they have to stop doing before you will consider doing surgery, whether that's uh, something, some kind of activity, do, activity they're doing or if their weight is too much or anything like that? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things you want to be looking at. Big one for me is smoking. Uh, obviously, a higher risk with almost every orthopedic surgery we do as far as wound complications and healing uh, for anybody smoking. I want them, I want them completely stop smoking. Uh, exception to that is, you know, if they've got bad avascular necrosis or they're cutting down and they're as far as they can get, but I definitely counsel those patients there at higher risk of complications than people that don't smoke. Um, as far as weight, my BMI cutoff is typically 40. Um, I'll go a little bit above that in certain situations as long as everything else is perfectly normal. So the non-smoker is not diabetic, um, but, you know, over 40 is definitely higher risk of complications. And then uh, for the diabetics, I want their A1C ideally less than 7. Uh, more than seven and definitely more than 7.5 to eight, there's higher risk of uh, infection and other complications as well. So those are kind of the hard stop ones as well as uh, dialysis. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do a hip replacement with somebody on dialysis after we've had many, many conversations on it, but the risk of infections been quoted is somewhere between three to five times higher than the general population. So, you know, ideally if they're waiting on a tr kidney transplant, I'll hopefully try and get them to the point of having that transplant before we would uh, do an arthroplasty. And I think that's so important because a lot of times, uh, or I, I can see how it could easy it could be to make the mistake of looking at the x-ray and then the patient says they're in pain and you don't know, get a proper H&P and then you find out they're in stage three kidney failure, you know, a really bad diabetic with poor uh, circulation and pulmonary problems. Um, but yeah, just to reiterate that, you know, getting a good history and physical exam and then, you know, making sure these patients are optimized prior to surgery can help. Uh, can help with their uh, outcomes. Now, what are some things that you look for on physical exam? Like, how do you physically examine these patients? Do you have them, are you having them, you know, walk in the office, look at their gait? Like, what are you, what are you looking for? 
Uh, so I've got my clinic set up so that the room where I'm working is on the way to the exam rooms where my patients go. So I try and get a cheater look and like watch them walking when they're coming back with our uh, medical assistants into the room. Um, and I feel like nobody can really walk perfectly normal the way they normally walk when you tell them walk normal. Uh, so I try and catch them when they don't know that I'm watching them walk, get an idea about their gait. Um, big thing I'm looking for is if they're kind of antalgic, if they're kind of shortening their stance uh, phase on one side or the other, as well as looking for hip, uh, hip flexion. Um, you know, Trendelenburg gait is something else we look for. Um, it's kind of hard concept sometimes for residents to get their head around. So I just tell them if they've got a Trendelenburg gait, their body is wrapping around the hip that's bad. They have to kind of lean over that side. So it's a way of kind of remember where that's coming from. I like that. Um, and then uh, for hip range of motion, um, having them laying uh, on their back on the exam table, I always examine the less symptomatic side first to try and get an idea of what their normal is and also kind of like mentally prepare what I'm going to be checking. Um, so check hip flexion. Um, I'm looking as I'm flexing them up, if they have what I refer to as uh, obligate external rotation, meaning as they flex the hip up, they'll have to externally rotate to kind of clear the osteophytes up front. Um, and then look for internal external rotation at 90 degrees of flexion. Uh, that kind of gives you a good idea of how much arthritis they've got there. Um, I also do a straight leg raise on every single patient, uh, just looking again to see if there's any of that spine overlaps type of situation. Um, and then I'm checking neurovascular exam discs. I'm also examining their knees while I've got them there. Uh, one, it's a good chance to get a normal knee exam if they're normal, but two is also some people have some concomitant knee issues as well. You can kind of pick that up early on. Um, and then another big key for me is just checking their pulses distally. If they've got palpable pulses, the odds of them being able to heal anything is from a vascular standpoint is very good. Yeah, that's the key to keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like we were mentioning before, sometimes those comorbidities, they can cause a major issue on a elective surgery. And next thing you know, you know, things way down the line a couple of years later, you could be talking about amputation. So, yeah, it is uh, good to do a thorough physical exam for sure. So moving on, you know, we got the history. We have a decent, a good physical on this patient as well. What kind of imaging are you, are you getting for this guy as well? So for all my patients, I do a standing AP pelvis x-ray. Um, most of the time we're getting some level of a frog leg lateral, but on the standing AP pelvis, kind of like you're, uh, demonstra you're showing here on the uh, video, for, if you're watching the video, um, you want to look at a couple things. You want to make sure, one, it's a good image that you can see the entire pelvis. Uh, most of the time I can see the lower part of the lumbar spine, so I'm looking for arthritis in the lumbar spine there as well, or any type of spine pathology. It might kind of cue me in there. And then for around the hip joint itself, I'm looking for the amount of joint space uh, between the femoral head and the acetabulum. Majority of the time that's narrowed out superiorly, um, but sometimes it can be narrowed out inferiorly or, or medially. When it's more narrow superiorly, that's usually kind of a wear and tear type of situation. Uh, when it's more narrow uh, medially and inferiorly, I have to think of a uh, inflammatory condition like maybe rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis can have that as well. Uh, I'm also looking for where their acetabulum is, uh, if they have a normal depth of their acetabulum or if they have a dysplastic type of situation where the hip tends to be, uh, hip center tends to be migrated a little bit proximally if they had hip dysplasia as a kid that uh, unfortunately nobody picked up. Um, and then I'm also getting usually a frog leg lateral to get a good angle at the, uh, at the femoral neck looking if there's anything going on uh, around the proximal femur as well. Um, so that's the majority of the uh, x-rays. And then for all my patients pre-op, I get a long leg standing alignment. So I get a uh, the ability to act accurately measure a mechanical uh, alignment. Okay, and so with those images, you know, do does does your staff? Because I think this makes a difference too. Does your staff know, you know, what you consider a good image, and you know, are are they pretty? I guess is that something you had to coach your staff your staff up on as well, just to make sure that you get the image that you want when these patients come into your clinic. Yeah, we we've got uh, kind of road rotating x-ray text so you can always tell when they've changed because you don't get as good of images sometimes you just got to go over there and say hey this is what I want um I've got a couple of patients I've had and I just remember their names that had like perfect x-rays so I'll just pull up that x-ray for them and say hey this is exactly what I want if you have questions I write the name on a sticky note just pull up and compare that uh compare that x-ray but yeah, it's definitely a challenge um another x-ray we're starting to get is a uh, seated and sta standing uh, lateral x-ray uh, mostly looking at like pelvic incident sacral slope uh, things of that nature, kind of looking more at that hip spine relationship we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, as of now, I kind of feel like we're at our infancy of understanding the hip spine relationship from a standpoint of uh, instability. 
or getting the cup in the ideal position. Um, and I feel eventually we're going to have be able to give ourselves some better guidelines of, you know, if this amount of pelvic distance change or this amount of sacral slope, then do this. But you know, right now it's just kind of one of those sort of figuring out if they're grouping them into either stiff, uh, stiff pelvis or mobile pelvis. Right. And so say we, you know, you have a patient that, you know, you saw them, um, they have really bad arthritis, you know, they're really symptomatic, they're trying non-operative management or conservative treatment, it hasn't worked. Um, you've gotten your x-rays, they're so severe, um, hip arthritis, you know, they're cleared, you know, they don't have any other medical problems. What are, I guess if we can move on to pre-op planning, what are some of the things that, you know, you want to be like on the the joint surgeon, when they look at, or when you guys look at uh, an X or AP pelvis of the hip, what are some things that you want to start to think of when you're saying, okay, well, this is kind of some of the things I have to think of as far as implant wise, offset, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of, a lot of different things you start thinking about. Uh, one of the first is as far as determining what type of implant you're going to use. I look at the uh, geometry of the femur. Uh, if they're a door A femur, where it's a very, you know, narrow canal, um, there's certain implants that handle that better that have a little bit longer stem that goes a little bit narrower. Uh, if they're a door C, like a really wide canal, then I start thinking more towards a cement uh, type situation because I don't know that I'm going to be able to get that great a fixation uh, with press fit. I usually use press fit stems. Um, other things I'm looking at, like you mentioned, offset, I'm looking if they have dysplasia, anything like that where I might want either a modular stem of some sort that would give me some rotational control or like a, a Wagner cone type of stem that would give me rotational control as well. Um, offset, you, know, you definitely want to recreate their native offset and their native leg length. Um, so I'm also kind of looking for, um, you know, what kind of stem is going to get me in that situation. Certain stems are better for certain conditions. So I think ideal situation is we want to be comfortable with a handful of different types of implants and be able to match whatever's best to the patient. I mean, one thing we didn't talk about, I guess, in history and physical, I forgot to mention was I always want to ask the patients if they have any perceived leg length discrepancy. Um, and then in that long leg alignment film that we get, I always check measure for actual. Um, if they have a perceived leg length discrepancy, I've got different uh, wood blocks that are five centimeter or that are uh, five millimeters increments from five millimeters up to 2.5 uh, centimeters. So I kind of try and figure out exactly how long they feel like they are. Excellent. So you know, just to kind of recap, you're talking about the door classification and that looks at the kind of the femoral shaft morphology and you're saying door A's, these are going to be patients that may, you may think of putting in a longer stem because they have a, you know, a more narrow canal versus door C's, maybe somebody that you may do a, you know, a, some type of cement, to, you know, a cemented uh, arthroplasty or cemented component. Um, and you also look at the, the dysplasia and to kind of determine um, how much offset you need or you want to kind of recreate their normal anatomy. So those are, I guess those are the big um, things that you think about when you're, when you're seeing these patients or when you're working them up preoperatively? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And since we mentioned those terms, can you, can you explain what offset is? Sure. So offset, and if people look at the video that got up, uh, offset is a measurement from the center of the femoral head going out laterally uh, until it intersects a line down the long axis of the femur. So basically it's how far the femur is laterally offset, that's the term, uh, from the center of the femoral head. Nice. And as far as, okay, so I guess we're, we're, we're about to run into like templating and things like that, which is fine. So as far as looking at offset, what are some of the things you can do to change, you know, change the offset or manipulate it, make it, make decrease it or increase it when you, when you're doing this preoperative uh, template. And we also have the acetabular offset too, correct? Like the two. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, so that's the other side. It's, you know, how far you are. It all depends on like, where you medialize your cup, where you like to put your cup. Um, you know, if you decrease their offset, you do a couple of things that are all kind of negative. You decrease their, uh, their abductor uh, lever arm, uh, which functionally weakens their abductors. And then also you increase the likelihood of dislocation if you decrease their offset. Uh, the contrary to the, or the uh, counter to that is if you increase their offset too much, uh, they'll start having some greater truck bursitis. Um, mm -hmm which you can usually treat with injections and things of that nature. In general, my pre preference is I'd rather deal with uh, increasing bursitis. somebody's offset a little bit, give them a little bit of bursitis, uh, than uh, increased risk of dislocation. And, and do you just measure that distance and then you get an implant that has that same amount, like that same distance as well? Like, is that how you're accounting for it? 
uh, when you're, you know, choosing your implant? No, uh, so what I'll usually do is I'll usually template. Um, and when I've template, I've got a couple of different uh, templates for implants. I don't have the uh, computerized stuff with the old school with the, uh, the kind of grease pencil type of deal, but so I'll put them up there and I'll try see which size. So I'll template the uh, Astabular cup first, figure out about the size that I want that to be. Um, my goal with the Astabular cup is I want to medialize down to approximately the floor of the cotyloid fossa. So essentially the medial border of the teardrop. And I want it at about 40, 45 degrees of abduction. Um, and as far as sides, superior to inferior, I like to ream into the sclerotic bone superiorly a little bit. And I like to have the inferior border of my cup at or just below the bottom of the teardrop. Um, and then once I'm done with that, I start templating on the femoral side. So I put different implants in different sizes up and I adjust them based on where they sit in the femoral canal that they're gonna have good bony contact. Um, very few implants and usually don't wanna take away any cortical bone. So you kind of line up where they're going to sit based on that. And then once I figure where they're sitting in the femur, then I look up to where they're sitting uh, as far as uh, the center rotation of the new stem relative to the femur. If it looks like I'm not getting the offset I need, I look at the high offset templates. Um, and if I'm still not getting the offset that I need, then I look at a different system. Okay. And I heard you call out some numbers that you were looking at as far as your cup and things like that. So what, what are we looking for? as far as you know, inclination and antiversion or retroversion, what, what are we looking for as far as these parameters for the acetabulum cup? Sure, so the classic, everybody talks about the Lewinic uh, you know, safe zone for acetabular cup placement. Um, that's a pretty good guideline overall. In general, I also try and match the patient's anatomy. Um, kind of figure that uh, whatever position God or whatever biology you know, evolution put their hip in, if you put their hip in that same position, they could do pretty well. Uh, traditionally, Lunix safe zone is about 45 degrees of invert of uh, inclination and about 15 to 20 degrees of uh, antiversion. Um, outside of that, and there's tolerances around that, but outside of that range, they're at higher risk of dislocation traditionally. Right. And you know what? And since we're talking about this, because honestly, it was something that was somewhat difficult for me to understand uh, when it came to, you know, the femur as a whole. What, what exactly do we mean by antiversion and retroversion? What, what is, like, I mean, it's probably going to be hard to explain this over a podcast. This is something like a, a video or something in person probably would make it so much easier. Um, but are, are you able to explain that at all for us? Yeah, I can, I can try. I kind of give you the explanation, give my resonance when we're talking about it. Um, so best way to measure it is on a 3D CT with cuts through the distal femur as well as the proximal femur. Um, and then you're looking at the posterior condylar axis, so the back part of the uh, of the femur, and comparing that to the angle that the femoral neck comes off of the femur, which is a very convoluted way of doing it. Um, the way I explain as far as simple terms is you think of which direction their patella is pointing. So if their leg is perfectly straight on, their foot is perfectly straight up, patella is perfectly straight up. If their feet, if there had no version to their proximal femur at all, their femoral neck would be coming off at a 90 degree axis medial to their leg. If they have antiversion, they're going to be coming off a little bit anterior to that. If they have retroversion, they'll be coming off a little posterior to that. Most people have, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood about 15, 20 degrees of, uh, of uh, antiversion of their proximal femur. So I'm usually trying to recreate that pretty, uh, you know, pretty close to anatomic if I can. Okay. And these are like the things in, in joint arthroplasty, uh, even as a resident, I mean, they're, Really simple concepts, but they're they're actually like pretty high yield, and, and people do get these things wrong. Um, since we're on that, uh, can you talk about inclination as well? Yeah, so inclination, you know, traditional safe zone is a forty degrees plus or minus ten degrees. Um, as far as you know, we used to worry about if you do increased inclination, there's less of the cup uh, poly surface in contact with the head. So you worry more about wear, which I don't think is as much of an issue now. Uh, if you have too much inclination or flatter cups, like 20 to 30 degrees of inclination, uh, they can start impinging uh, when they abduct their leg or bring the leg away from midline. Uh, and that can cause some dislocation and some pain issues as well. So ideally, you know, you want to be somewhere on the 40 plus or minus 10 degree range. Um, and, you know, by and large, if you match their anatomy, most people are in that ballpark. Okay. All right. I'm loving this. This is, uh, this is all great stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of good info. Yep, I'm pretty sure. So, all right, this is a little secret for everybody. Everyone don't know that me and Cody, we're 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 really talking 
behind the scenes when we're recording this and no one sees all the things that Cody asked me, like, can you please explain this to me, Jay? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> you just went over so much stuff for him. So I really appreciate it. Oh, um, absolutely. Uh, this guy's funny. <laughs> so, okay. At this point, we're templating. We, we, we got our cup because we started with our cup. All okay. right. Uh, so we, we pretty much, we, we think we got the size that we want the cup. We got it medialized to where we want. Um, how are we put? Oh, you, we even actually, about I, yeah. yeah, I have one thing real quick. Uh, can you, can you kind of talk about the center of rotation and, and, you know, I guess this importance in, in establishing that or recreating the center of rotation versus of the acetabulum versus a femur? Of course. Um, so center rotation to your femur is going to be a point at the center of where the cup is. If you pretend your cup was a full circle, it's the exact center of that uh, cup is where your acetabular center rotation is going to be. Um, you can adjust your femoral center rotation uh, wherever you want to be uh, as far as to adjust your leg length and your offset. But no matter what, if you have that hip reduced, which you damn sure better by the time you're done with the surgery, um, your femoral center rotation has to go with acetabular center rotation. Mm -hmm. Is you know, If it's out of line with that, it's not going to be a reduced cup. So um, your center rotation for acetabular is kind of set by where your cup is. And then on the femoral side, you can adjust your head size as far as your pluses or minus as well as your offset um, to adjust your leg length and the offset to match as close as you can their native anatomy, uh, as well as you can increase your leg length if you need to to, you know, to make up for a leg length discrepancy uh, or adjust offset to uh, either match offset or improve your, uh, improve your stability. Ah, okay. And I think we mentioned a little bit about a little bit earlier, that if you increase your offset, you know, you have a, you, you're, you have a more chance of getting bursitis, but does that do anything to your leg length discrepancy? So if you increase just offset, that should, does not increase leg length. Um, that said, most stems are in a situation where if you increase the head size, so instead of going like a zero, if you go to a plus 2.5 2 or plus five or whatever your system allows, majority of the time when you increase offset that way, you're also increasing leg length. Mm -hmm. ah, okay that makes that makes some sense there are and, some systems where the stem maintains leg length when you go from a high offset to a regular so the high offset your neck cut your neck angle becomes a little bit flatter uh, as a way i kind of think of it it looks a little bit more like a varus uh, neck situation so when you do a higher offset stem a lot of the times you lose a little bit of leg length um, so you can adjust yeah, that can be a way to increase your offset without necessarily increasing your leg length if you need it depending on uh, patient's anatomy and uh, I guess I was going to move forward into the different types of, because you just spoke about the offset and I was just thinking, you know, you have modular versus non-modular components, but Jay, is there anything else that you think you wanted to speak about as far as pre-op planning, as far as, you know, acetabulum, femur? Um, you know, I, I think this is like a really, a really good topic. And even when I'm listening to it right now, I still get somewhat confused to be honest. I have to sit back and kind of think about changing these things and, there's been times even in the OR, all of a sudden, like you said, you have to change things on the fly and I have to sit back and think, okay, the head size going up. So, okay, all right, this, this is, the neck is going to be this now. We got to worry about leg length and things like that. It's so many different moving parts. But can we just, just like a real quick brief on this one more time? Okay. So say we have offset, we have leg length, uh, and we have just our cup. And can you just, just mention almost, if we could, in almost three or four or five lines, just the things that you can do to change those and how that will benefit you, just so we could sum it up for our listeners. If you could, Dr. Shield, I know that's kind of a big ask. No, no worries. Um, so you want to adjust your cup to try to match their native anatomy and try and get as close to their hip center as you can. A uh, majority of your motion or movement as far as increasing and uh, adjusting offset and leg length is going to come on your femur side. Um, if you're looking at your templates, and they do this on the OED a fair amount, and you'll get it on your ABOS exam as well. So if the femoral head, or the center of the femur is superior to the center of the cup, that femur is going to have to shift down to make those centers line up. So that's going to increase your leg length. If the center of your femur, or the center where your femoral head is going to be, is inferior to the center of your cup, you're going to have to shorten the leg for that to line up. If your center of femoral head is medial to the center head of your S tab or of your cup, your femur is going to have to lateralize or shift up to increase your offset to line up. And if the center of your femoral head is lateral to the center of the cup, you're going to have to medialize. So just think of it as a way of when you're looking at your templating films, the center of your femur has to go to the center of the cup. 
and just picture what that's going to do to your femur. Uh, that's kind of the way I try to remember as far as what, whether you're going to increase offset or leg length. Uh, uh, people uh, looking at the video, uh, the cup that's being, or the um, images shown here, the center of the femoral head is directly superior to the center of the acetabular cup. So if you do that, that is going to increase your leg length because the center of the femoral head has to shift down to the center of the cup. Um, if that center of the femoral head was medial to the cup, it would increase your offset because the femur would have to shift lateral to get it back into a reduced position. It's definitely a uh, complex topic that even I have to review, still have to review fairly often just to make sure I get everything straight. But it makes right. sense, like you say, the, the femur center of rotation, it, it, has, to, it has to follow, it, it has to move to the, the, the acetabulum, not the other way around. You just gotta remember the femur is the one that's moving. And if you can keep that in mind, it can kind of help you out on what's, what's gonna be the, the end, uh, end consequence of it all, so. so uh, so I guess like for, for example, we'll just kind of just throw out some cases here. So if we had a patient that had really bad coxa profunda where the femoral head is, is you know, medial to acetabulum, preoperatively we're thinking, okay, we're going we're gonna to need to increase the offset in order to get the femoral center rotation in line with the acetabular center rotation. Is that so far, am I, am I correct in what, what we're saying? Well, so for profunda cases, you're usually going to lateralize the acetabular center because your cup is not gonna be as far medial as their native hip center is or where they've developed to. So that alone will increase your offset to a degree. Ah, okay. So you lateralize the, mm -hmm. the acetabulum. And then, so in, in cases, just like we said here, where, you know, you have, you know, really bad superior lateral migration of the femoral head, uh, you know, pre-op we're thinking, okay, we're gonna probably have to increase the leg length or we're gonna have to bring the, bring the femor, femoral, um, uh, center rotation down to match acetabulum, so we're likely going to have to bring that down. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Uh, Jay, I know you're over there confused and taking notes and <laughs> shivering in your boots. Hey, <laughs> you know that's all right. That's why it's the five-year <laughs> program. That is okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is like, this is really high yield. You see these questions on ortho bullets. You see it everywhere. And uh, it's it's really easy if you know what's going on, and it can be, it can really stump you if you don't. So, if, if, if you can kind of grasp what, we, what we're talking about now, you, it's kind of hard to miss these questions. So I'm glad that we spent so much time on it. It's actually awesome, I think. And can you mention again what increasing the size of the femoral head will do? Because, um, you know, we mentioned before increasing the size of that femoral head component may um, increase your offset. It would also possibly increase your leg length. And yeah, I know it has to do with how many degrees of rotation before you get impingement or, you know, it kind of makes it a little bit more stable. Can we, can we just talk about that? Sure. And I think an important thing to keep in mind is that there's a difference between increasing the size of the femoral head and increasing the distance or where the femoral head sits on the stem. Um, so as far as size, majority of the time we're doing 36 or 32 millimeter heads. Uh, back in the old days, back when, you know, the staff that trained the staff that trained me were doing it. They were doing 22 millimeter heads on total capsulectomies and they had really high dislocation rates. We kind of realized the bigger head, uh, once you get above a 28, it's hard to say if there's any difference. Uh, but the bigger the femoral head is as far as diameter, uh, the farther range of motion you've got before the neck will start impinging uh, on the cup. When the neck impinges on the cup, that starts to lift the femoral head out of the poly, out of the acetabulum, and that's where your dislocations come from. Uh, but as far as the, you know, plus sizes, like we always say, you know, 36 plus 1.5, 36.5, the plus or minus is how far the, uh, the uh, femoral head or the ball that you put on sits up on the, uh, on the femoral component. So the higher the plus numbers is, the majority of the time that will increase your offset and increase your leg length, which is, and both of those things will improve your stability, which is why if we're doing a trial, in the operating room and somebody's not quite as stable as you want it, say a zero, we might try a plus two five and all of a sudden it makes them a little bit stable, more stable because we've increased their offset and increased their leg length. Both things uh, help tighten the soft tissue and make them a little more stable. And this is why you want to get as many of these cases down as you can <laughs> because, uh, you know, it, it is, it, it can be confusing, but uh, I think the more, the more you do it, the better the more understanding that you get with these, these types, you know, just the language that we're using. So, okay, let's say we're, we've kind of, we've, we've done our template and we have us in a game plan going into the OR. We always need a game plan. Uh, but before we get too far, what approaches uh, 
are kind of what approaches are out there, which ones do you prefer and why do you prefer them? Sure. There's tons of different approaches. Uh, kind of the mainstays of the anterior approach, or direct anterior approach, uh, anterior lateral approach, direct lateral approach, and then the posterior, posterior lateral approach. Um, I don't do the lateral approach or an anterior lateral approach that much. Um, the risk of the lateral approach is uh, denervating the abductors and they get kind of a Trendelenburg gait. Uh, my personal, you know, I, I know there's a lot of people who do a very good job with that approach and a very low risk of limp. All the times I've done it or seen it, it's had a limp. Uh, so my thought process is, you know, I want to do an approach that I don't want the patients to limp afterwards. My goal is for them to walk as normal as possible. Um, so I do both posterior and anterior approach. Um, anterior approach traditionally has a little bit higher stability, so a little bit lower dislocation rate. Uh, it's a little bit faster recovery, though not beyond six months. Um, posterior approach is kind of more traditional approach. Um, there's you know, better access, a little bit more visibility, and a little bit more extensive, although you can extend an anterior approach if you're experienced with that. Um, and then, you know, I think when patients ask me about posterior versus anterior, I like doing anterior more. I think it's a little more fun. Um, but I'd be hard pressed to tell them is there any significant difference in outcomes beyond about six weeks after surgery. Okay. And so what about, say if you have a fairly large patient, uh, a patient with a, a, a big panis, uh, does that change any, does that change any thoughts or as far as which approaches you might choose? Yeah, with a, with a bigger panis, I'm probably going to lean more towards going posterior. Although if you guys have gotten a chance to do many uh, anterior approaches in residency, you kind of realize that there's not a whole lot of people that are real, real thick over where the anterior approach really goes. Um, but the big part about the pan is that I don't want a big belly or anything pushing down on the incision. And I don't want the incision trying to heal in like a, a sweaty bodily crease. So I might be a little bit more prone to go posterior. Um, I think, you know, bigger people are a, the bigger person is, the heavier they are. Uh, it becomes more challenging no matter what approach you go. But I tend to lean more posterior for that. Yeah, I think it's really awesome to have, uh, to have, you know, both of those in your repertoire, just in case, because I feel like, you know, like, like you said, that, that, that large pan is sometimes it just that lapping over the incision. I don't know that could cause, you know, wound complications and things like that. So if you have the posterior in your repertoire too, where you can do that and not have to worry about that as much is, is great to have. Um, man, Dr. Short, have you ever smelled fear? Absolutely. Watch this, Dr. Short. So, uh, Cody. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I'm listening. <laughs> you which, uh, which nerve are you, are you worried about? It's, it's like classic in the anterior approach, right? And which one are we, we, we totally worried about it that you might knock out? And some of the, post, some of the doctors who worry about uh, posterior approaches, uh, who only do posterior approaches. This is like their only knockdown to the anterior approach. Like, oh yeah, this this is what you, you have mean to worry the, about. Um, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. That's what you're thinking of for the anterior approach. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Stewart, I had to go slow and so that he had enough time to Google it. <laughs> I didn't want to make him look bad on live uh, on live radio, on, the, on the podcast. But well, yeah, you, got, you got it right on. I, I tell all my patients that do an anterior approach on, you're going to have some numbness in that distribution. A majority of the time improves by six months. Um, if you look at the studies, when you specifically ask patients about uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve issues, 80% of them will have it. If you don't ask it, 15% of them bring it up. So I always tell them, you are going to have it. It's not, you know, a functional limitation. Um, and, you know, knock on wood, so far I haven't had any patients with any long-term uh, long issues with it. Now, the other risk of the anterior approach relative to posterior is a higher risk of femur fractures, both intraoperatively and in the first couple of weeks postoperatively, um, which is largely related to kind of the angle that you have to broach it. And you know, I think it can be largely mitigated by being careful, but it definitely does happen. Okay. And yeah, so what, what, what do you think, or I'm pretty sure I don't, I hate stating things and I'm not hundred percent sure, but as far as long-term outcome with all these approaches, there's, is there really any difference in the long-term outcome for these patients? No, I don't think so. And I like I have patients asking for anterior approach and they'll ask, talk, we'll talk about posterior approach. And I tell them, you know, I think a well done posterior approach and a well done anterior approach with modern components, modern techniques and a, uh, you know, posterior capsular repair. If you have a posterior approach, I don't think there's going to be any long term difference between the two of them. I think if you've got a surgeon that, uh, you know, primarily does posterior, you should have a posterior. If you've got a surgeon primarily does anterior, you should do an anterior. If you have a surgeon does both, then you can pick what you want to do. Um, you know, asking a, a posterior surgeon to do an anterior or an anterior surgeon 
that doesn't do a lot of posters do a poster is kind of like going to a steak place asking for lasagna you know you should go with uh, whatever's in their wheelhouse yeah uh, yeah like you said i definitely think it's just depending on which ones is is, is best in their hands but for some reason i feel like patients think the anterior approach is like better they feel like it's more I don't know. I don't know if they think it's better or it's less invasive. Maybe the scar. Or something. Yeah, it's like people come in kind of asking for that. They like they heard about it and they want to, you know, but I don't know. It's it's definitely a uh, definitely out there. Patients come in looking for it, asking for it. They're looking for people that do it. Um, honestly, I, I tell them flat out, I was like, I don't think it's necessarily better than a posterior approach once you just pass for six weeks. You know, the earlier recovery is a little bit tempting um, to a lot of people. I think in a lot of situations, a lot of areas, it becomes more of a marketing uh, gim- or not gimmick, but a marketing, uh, you know, tool. Like a tactic, a tool, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, all of my, uh, you know, I had five co-fellows, every single one of them that, uh, you know, when they were applying for jobs, they got asked, do you do an anterior approach? And places want an anterior approach just to have it because they don't want to lose patients that want to go somewhere else for an anterior approach. Mm. Something to think about there and, and, and think about that. But yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. well, that was good. I think that was a great, um, great overview as far as the different approaches to the hip. And I think you, answer at least touched on all the stuff i've seen that, that's asking questions and, and then you know the real life impl- uh, implications for it now i just want to you know we spoke a little bit about it earlier on how you choose what design of your implant versus another but can we kind of go into implant designs like when you'd use a cemented versus a cementless versus a porous you know or, or a press fit uh press fit implant can we kind of talk a little bit about these different types of implants for hip arthroplasty absolutely I think the, you know, the traditional gold standard is still probably a cemented femoral uh, component and a cementless acetabular component. Um, in the U.S., we tend to use mostly cementless. That's what I use for most of mine, uh, most of my patients. Um, it's a little bit easier if you have to do a revision. Obviously, there's a lot of people would argue that you shouldn't do something based on the revision. You should do something based on how to make it work best uh, primarily. Um, you know, patients that are older, um, patients that have had like a femoral neck fracture, I always use cemented for a femoral neck fracture because as one of my trauma staff told me, they just broke the biggest bone in their body with a relatively innocuous falls. So they're trying to tell you that their bone cannot be trusted. So mm. put cement in there. Um, you know, I think the, there's a lot of the good data on the cementless components that a lot of them are just as good as a, uh, a cementless component um, at this point in time. You know, there's definitely a higher risk of fracture during surgery and after surgery with a cementless component. Uh, with the cemented component, there's a little bit higher risk of pulmonary insult, and then obviously uh, revision can be a little bit more complicated unless you're doing like a cement and cement or one of the more, uh, you know, one of those techniques. It's a little bit uh, on the advanced end. And how do you choose which um, which like porous coated uh, if you're doing cementless femoral stem? How do you choose which stem? Because you know you know sometimes we'll go to like these meetings and they'll be like 13 stems in front of me, and I'm like I, I'm not sure how to choose from any one of these. <laughs> You know, how do you how do you like go about choosing those what to use yeah. I, so i think as far as this applies for hip and knee replacements if you're using one of the big companies you know the striker depew uh you know smith nephew um using one of those one of the big components as well as zimmer biomet all of them have good implants good track records um, i think a big decision which isn't going to fall into the already question but a big part of your decision is the reliability of your reps uh, wherever you're at, different parts of the country, different companies have better reps, and that's a big determinant. Um, you could use the, have the best implant in the entire world, but if your rep is not reliable and doesn't get you all the stuff or have all the equipment when you need it, it doesn't matter how good they are. Um, and then as far as the stems, you know, I, usually most people have a couple of stems that they're comfortable with. They use fairly often. Um, I use mostly stems that I used in fellowship. Um, for posterior, I use Accolade, um, and then I use the uh, Trident 2 cup. And then for anteriors, I use usually Depew Actus or Depew Karai stem. Again, those are stems I'm more comfortable with. I like the Actus for the anterior because it's a dual taper. Um, I like the concept of a dual taper stem from an anterior approach just because it sits in the, in the femur a little bit better um, than, the, uh, than the single taper that, like, the, uh, like the Accolade does. Awesome. Yeah, and like you say, uh, your rep can – you know, in a way, I, they, they can kind of break, you know, I don't know, they can make, I don't know if they can make a case, but they can definitely break a case. You know, if you, like you say, you thought you had certain parts there and find out, you know, you thought it was in the back room, but it's not even in the building or something. Yeah, it could really, really cause some issues. I have seen that happen before. Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, you're, 
your rep will not make your case. I mean, if you, if you need a rep to get through a case or to walk you through it, you know, everybody always makes the joke about the ortho uh, surgeon and their striker rep, uh, you know, being lifting buddies and buddies, everything else. But, you know, good reps are there. They make sure they have all the equipment there. Um, I think the reps help the back table and your techs a lot more. Um, I'm in a situation where our techs rotate every couple of months. So my most senior tech has been doing joints for less than four months. Um, so it's good having somebody back there because in our institution, I'm training residents. Um, I'm less, I'm just over a year out of fellowship myself. So I'm still kind of getting things figured out what I like to do. And then there's techs that are learning as well. So it helps having somebody else to teach somebody. So I'm not kind of running all three parts of the game at once. Yeah, that's, that's actually kind of tough, but it's the reality at a large institution or learning institution, education teaching institution, you have moving parts all the time, people change. And uh, so, you know, they have to learn your whole, your, all your steps and you have to kind of keep doing that as well as teaching residents. I'm sure that's something you like to do, but you know, you just have to kind of keep, uh, keep going over your, your steps so that the case remains efficient and everyone is still able to learn as much as possible, but you know, things are moving on like, like it should. Um, and I like what we talked about as far as the implant designs, but before we, we move on, uh, can you talk about like special liners that you may consider for certain patients, things like that, maybe like constrained liners and, uh, when that, when that would be something that you would use and yeah. uh, things like that? Absolutely. So as far as the bearing surfaces, uh, you know, it's traditionally, it's a, usually a hard on soft bearing, which a hard on soft means metal on poly, ceramic on poly, something of that nature. Uh, some people will use a ceramic on ceramic bearing, um, has very, very good wear properties. Uh, so for like younger patients, um, but there's definitely a side effect of a, uh, of a squeak uh, that you can get. And a fair amount of patients have it if you actually ask for it, as well as the thing you worry about is a ceramic fracture. Uh, usually the ball does not fracture, but the liner can fracture. And I've seen a couple of those when that ceramic liner fractures, it's into a billion pieces. You can never get it all the way out. So you got to do ceramic on ceramic after that. Um, and then as far as the kind of the advanced liners, um, we sort of think of as advanced liners like a dual mobility liner. What a dual mobility is, it's a normal head with a polyethylene on it that is like a ball inside of a ball so it can move around outside of it and then inside it, that goes into a metal uh, liner on the shell. So that allows a little bit more range of motion, a little bit farther uh, mobility before you start impinging to, as far for risk of dislocation. That helps with uh, reducing that. Um, so I will use dual mobility in patients that are have either like a prior spinal fusion, so there can be a higher risk for dislocation, um, or patients that are doing for a total hip or a fracture, uh, as they can have a higher risk of dislocation. Um, constrained liners, I try to use as infrequently as possible. Uh, what a constrained liner is, is, is the ball is actually locked into uh, the acetabular side and then connects into the femur. Uh, so it, instead of allowing more range of motion before it pinches, it actually reduces your range of motion. Um, but because it's constrained, there's a lot more stress going through the implants on the acetabular side. So you can get some more wear on the acetab or on the polyethylene. Um, and you can also dislocate the polyethylene from the, uh, from the cuff, which is an issue as well. So constrained is usually li fairly limited use for me. Situations where I think of that is if somebody's got a very well-positioned acetabular cup, very well-positioned uh, stem, and they just keep dislocating. If they've got like neuromuscular disorders, like we talked about earlier, uh, you know, Parkinson's, uh, bad Alzheimer's, um, you know, multiple sclerosis sometimes can uh, have issues with that. Um, then I will think about converting it just to a constrained liner, but by and large, I try and avoid those as much as possible. Excellent. And I think, you know, we kind of spoke, I know there, there are a lot of complications that you can get from, you know, undergoing total hip arthroplasty, but I think we spoke a little, about a little bit earlier, you're talking about the risk of uh, iatrogenic fracture, earlier you're talking about the anterior approaches, uh, we spoke about instability. You can have recurrent dislocations, of course, infection, which is a you know a big risk and you know a big uh, thing with these periprosthetic infections or these cases. Are there any other complications that we should kind of generally you know be on the lookout for? Or think of you know when, for anybody undergoing any type of hip arthroplasty. Yeah, there's definitely other complications to worry about. You know, like you mentioned, infection. That's the biggest one. That's the uh, you know the thing that keeps joint surgeons up at night and paranoid as heck. And you. Know, that's the reason that, every, you know, if you work with seven different orthopedic surgeons that do joint replacements, you're going to have seven different ways of draping and everyone's the right one. It's all reducing that risk of infection. Um, you know, other risks, there's demonstrating nerves. Uh, the lateral femur cutaneous nerve gets usually pushed a fair amount uh, with the anterior approach like we talked about. So that usually recovers. 
Um, you can have a sciatic nerve injury if somebody has a very uh, short hip, meaning they've got their hip is uh, just plastic and if you're bringing their femoral head or their center of their hip back down, uh, especially more than about two to two and a half centimeters, you're gonna have a higher risk of stretching that out. Um, so that's something to watch out for. You can also injure the sciatic nerve directly. Shouldn't be much of an issue with a posterior approach, but you could definitely get close to it. Um, you know, other issues, instability, kind of like you mentioned, that's a very, very big one that we worry about. Um, it used to be someone they were at a 10%. Now it's probably less than 2% for all comers, uh, partially because we know a little bit better where to put our cup and our stem. Um, and people are pretty aggressive about testing those. Um, you know, one of the things I like about the anterior approach is it's kind of like a video game. I get sort of a cheat code by using fluoro so I can see exactly where my cup is. Uh, once I've adjusted that fluoro to match the standing AP pelvis to make sure I'm getting their true, uh, their true uh, antiversion as well as inclination. Um, limb length discrepancy is the most common reason, this is on the OID once in a while, of why orthopedic surgeons are sued after a hip replacement. Um, I tell every place, patient beforehand, I'm going to try and make your legs as close as matching as possible. Uh, with the caveat being that if you are not as stable as I want you to be, one of my tricks is increasing the, the plus uh, on the head size, which will make them a little bit longer legs, a little bit longer uh, offset. Um, and then polyethylene wear used to be a big issue back 20, 30 years ago. Um, you know, my 700 and seven, or 719 joint replacements in fellowship and 120 some uh, revisions, I did not see a single polyethylene wear, or I saw, sorry, I saw one uh, revision of polyethylene for wear and it was a poly that had been in since 1996. Uh, oh, so I think man. we've largely gotten oh. that uh, problem handled. Um, you know, you guys talked about stems a little bit. The modular stems are at a little bit higher risk of having complications where the neck comes into the stem. Um, they can get some metal on metal disease or some, uh, some fretting there. Um, so that's definitely a uh, concern. And then the metal on metal, we don't really do metal on metal total hips. They still do it for resurfacing. Uh, that's a big still favorite of question on the OID as well as the uh, ABOS examination is, um, you know, what to do about metal on metal, how to do the workup, the labs and things of that nature. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. Yep. And I think sometimes that they bring up like, uh, I think you can sometimes get like a pseudo tumor and things like that. Is yeah, that so you can get a yeah. uh, aseptic lymphocytic reaction that becomes a big pseudo tumor. Um, when you get in there clinically, it's a big collection of fluid, usually just kind of either blackish fluid or the tissues around it look kind of abnormally black. Um, and then when you look on the, uh, usually on the trunnion, um, underneath the uh, head ball, there's kind of a blackish color to that as well. There we go, dropping pearls. Well, Dr. Shewitt, I really enjoyed this talk. Um, it's been definitely helpful for me. I, I kind of went and sought you out. I, I um, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do with my stuff and arthroplasty is still like on my list. So I uh, do enjoy when we can switch it up and finally get something different. We're, we're really trauma heavy here, but we're, we're slowly changing that. So uh, we really appreciate you coming on the show and, and spending this time with us and, and, and giving us this good information. Uh, Jay and Cody, appreciate having me on here. And yeah, any questions or anything at all, let me, uh, let me know. Arthroplasty is a, a great field. You know, it's patients that are pretty debilitated before we operate on them. They're all very happy and you know, added bonuses, a lot of them are older patients, they're retired, so they got time to you know, make you cookies, especially around the holidays or bring you food <laughs> nice. and stuff like that. Nice. Uh, Not so. to mention, like, the, the hip the hip replacement is, like, one of the best surgeries out there, right? I mean, yeah, as far as... the most successful surgery in orthopedics, and I think number two behind cataracts as far as uh, biggest bang for your buck in terms of, uh, you know, quality of life improvement and, uh, compared to the uh, cost of doing the surgery. That is amazing. If you, if anyone ever been in this case, I mean, it's unbelievable that someone would compare this to cataract surgery in any kind of way, but uh, it's awesome. I, I really do like to see the outcomes, you know, the large majority of them go well, you know, of course, and when they don't you just have to, you know, that's what they, they pay us the big bucks for and we have to figure it out to make them see what we got to do to get them back well as well. Uh, and like you said, Dr. Shewitt, uh, as far as people reaching out to you, we always ask our, our guests, is there any way that they would like to be contacted, whether it's a social media platform versus a uh, email address or anything like that? Sure. Uh, easiest way to get a hold of me is probably on Twitter. Uh, my, I got two different uh, Twitter accounts. One is DJ and then my last name, S-C-H-U-E-T-T, uh, at DJ Shewitt. And then the other one is, uh, from when I used to, when I write the articles for Growing Blog, is Nanderthal. It's at N-A-A-N-D 
T E R T H A A L. So N A N D E R T H A A L all together. Got it. I did not know you were on Gomer's blog. I I was telling uh Cody about that a while back, but so Gomer, Gomer blog is the one that's kind of like you know, uh, like medical satire or yeah, absolutely. It's like the you know a lot of times we just refer to it as the onion for uh, for the medical side. So yeah, I started writing for that a couple of years ago when I was uh, stationed over in Okinawa. I had some I had some downtime. It's been a it's been a good relief there too. <laughs> that is really cool. That is really cool. All right, so we're, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you again, Dr. Shewitt. I really enjoyed this show. I'm probably going to listen back to it a couple times. So thank you for, for coming out and sharing this time with us. And thank you everyone for listening in.